Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the Managing Editor of Infection Control Today, where we want to give infection preventionists and other healthcare professionals the information they need to battle COVID-19. What can we learn from somebody who has to battle COVID-19 where that coronavirus seems to cause the most harm, infects and kills the most people? We know that is what goes on in nursing homes, but COVID-19 also runs amok in Native American reservations. Joining me is Dr. Jonathan O'Reilly, the Indian Health Service Chief Clinical Consultant for Infectious Diseases. Dr. Aralu is also the Chief Clinical Consultant for Infectious Diseases at the Gallup Indian Medical Center in the Navajo Nation. Dr. Aralu has a special interest in HIV, tuberculosis, and sexually transmitted disease care in rural communities. The Gallup Indian Medical Center provides services to people over a huge expanse of land, and it's a population rife with chronic health issues including diabetes, alcoholism, and cardiovascular disease. And underlying health issues make someone especially vulnerable to COVID-19, as we all know. In other words, Dr. Aralu and his staff have their work cut out for them. But they've come up with some very innovative ways to tackle COVID-19. Dr. Aralu, thanks for joining us here at Infection Control today. Hi, thanks for, for calling me today. So uh, tell us a little more about the challenges you face and what you did about them. Sure. So we uh, live in a very um, rural part of the United States, but this facility itself is in what's called a border town to the Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. So we serve both an, an urban population and we also serve a very rural population uh, with um, folks who live far from the city and many of them do not have amenities like running water, cell phone access, and in some cases even electricity. So that's the, the general um, situation here. We had no experience with COVID-19 like almost everybody in the world right. until around until March of 2020 when the infection exploded in this area. And we had to uh, start from scratch and create a COVID care treatment program here in Gallup. So, uh, uh, Native American reservations along with uh, long-term care facilities seem to be in, in the nexus, nexus of these of this COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Uh, why is that so? Uh, I mean, speaking toward about the Native American reservations. Oh, so um, that's a that's a, a very very good question. One, we we know that the um, the virus arrived in this general region through um, pe folks traveling from urban areas back to rural areas. And it, it appears that it initially um, affected a, uh, a group of people attending a church conference. And we, we know that anywhere in the world, when there are people coming together in congregate settings, whether they be schools, churches, indoor sporting events, though, or eating places, those are high risk situations. So we, um, we, we think that a lot of the spread initially started in those kind of events. Later on, we saw um, spread um, through family units. So if a, a family um, lives, even if they live in a remote place, if they have multiple people living in the same home, it's very easy for everybody in that family to be affected with the virus. And uh, uh, one of our very good freelance writers, Jan, Diana is writing about some of the challenges you face and some of the innovative ways you, you face those challenges. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So this is number one, just the facility kind of um, issues. This is a this is an older building. Um, we have a uh, roughly 60 years old and it was necessary early on to make it a safe place to handle COVID, to keep staff safe, and keep the patients safe. So we, we in, initially, um, very early on, started to do outdoor testing under um, a, a portico so that um, people could have their, could drive up to a, um, a covered area right. to be protected from rain and to uh, get swabbed right in their car. So we, we were one of the first to do that in our state. Um, in addition, we created an outdoor triage area so folks who are coming in with, with possible or probable COVID 
could get screened outdoors in tents and could be managed um, safely in a, in a respiratory care unit where they could get um, immediate care by expert emergency room um, physicians. And um, they, we even uh, set up a tent where you could do an outdoor code or intubation. So um, this, this allowed us to um, take care of people um, in a, in a, outside of the building and uh, from everything from just somebody coming in with the sniffles to someone who have, has respiratory failure and needs to go on a ventilator. So that was, a, that was a, an innovation we had to make really fast at the very beginning. We also, we also made some upgrades to the, um, upgrades to the, the hospital facility itself, turning um, certain rooms into negative airflow rooms to make them safer. We, we turned some old office space into hospital beds, and so the, the, this facility required a lot of upgrading. How, how do you go about turning uh, rooms into negative uh, pressure rooms? Um, it's extremely complicated. You you have to um, seal up some of the ductwork on the sides of the rooms because in, in the old days a, you'd have pipes going through the, the walls or through the ceiling that are not sealed. So you, each room is on, is contiguous in airflow with all the rooms in an entire ward. So you have to seal up those holes, and the um, the, the engineers also have to do things like punch holes in the windows, connect a HEPA air filter fan unit to blow air out at a rate faster than the air is being pumped into the room by the air conditioner. So um, I'm, I'm not a, uh, an engineer, but I, I learned a little bit about engineering over the last few months. <laughs> I guess you learned a little bit about, about a lot of things the last few <laughs> It's sad, you, you, didn't, you didn't mess around. I mean, uh, um, some of the healthcare um, community has been accused probably sometimes unjustly but maybe dry, reacting a little too slow. We read the reports coming out of Wuhan, China, and we were very concerned. We, 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 um, we, we thought that we were in a rural place and we were, we were worried that um, the referral hospitals in the big city might possibly become filled and that we would, we would not be able to transfer sick patients to places like Albuquerque or Flagstaff. So we wanted to be prepared so that uh, we could handle patients here in, in Gallup and on Navajo, I'm not just talking about Gallup Indian Medical Center, but the whole Navajo area, try to be prepared so that we could handle, handle patients with COVID here. And, and how, how do you measure success and have you been successful? So, um, how do you measure success when you start to see um, a decline in the incidence of COVID? So this is, we, first we talked about the building. Obviously, to, to care, take care of the acutely ill people, you need, you need that. But you also need to do contact investigation and case management. So on Navajo, there's a, a group led by, um, um, by Dr. Sonia Shen and um, Dr. Jill Moses, who are doing um, contact tracing and then case management. So they look after folks after they're discharged home from the hospital or from the, um, or from the emergency department. And these, these involve a lot, these in, in, involve um, people like public health nurses, uh, tribal community health workers, et cetera, working in collaboration. So you have the, the Navajo Nation working with Indian Health Service and some of the non-federal sites to deliver care at remote places. That's um, interesting. And there's been some talk about the infection preventionists um, or infection prevention expertise, at least, migrating out of the hospital setting and into the community because the community needs help in trying to battle this. So uh, I, I guess what the question is asking, do you think that that's going to happen uh, on a large scale throughout the country, or should it? I, I think it must. So the, the inpatient COVID-19 population is simply the tip of the iceberg. For every case in, in the hospital, there are lots of cases out in the community. And to actually stop a, um, to actually stop a, a, a COVID-19 outbreak, you need to get rapid diagnosis. So that's why you need to have lots and lots of rapid testing. We, we use a, uh, a uh, 
we have a, an in-house um, PCR-based assay that allows us to have an answer within a couple hours. And then when that result comes back positive, you have public health nurses jumping all over that, making telephone calls. Um, I should, I need to mention another important component of, of the local response to COVID-19. We, I mentioned that we are both a rural and an urban um, healthcare center. And in the urban setting, there are many people who are exposed, who are, um, are experiencing homelessness. And we were very concerned early on that there could be spread in places like homeless shelters and also in, you know, uh, places where, where persons who are experiencing homeless might congregate um, in a really tight place, like a motel or something like that. So we, um, we early on, um, just a, a team of doctors, um, public health nurses, and many, many volunteers um, got together to, um, to create, with the state of New Mexico, a, a, a set of four motels in the Gallup area where people could spend their time in isolation after they were diagnosed with COVID-19. So they wouldn't have to take COVID-19 back to one of the homeless shelters. And this, I think this was a, 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 a really, really helpful way to stop spread in that community. Because if you don't stop spread in that community, when those persons who are experiencing homelessness return back to a rural site, they could bring the virus with them. The other thing we use the motels for were to, ice, to, to provide quarantine for, for persons who were exposed so that if they were to develop COVID-19, they wouldn't um, bring it home to their family far away. So the motels were a, a local in, innovation that worked really well for this particular population. Uh, in an ironic sense, is it possible that being uh, the Navajo Nation Reservation gave you a certain amount of freedom to act and react that possibly isn't found in other places in the country or? Well, we, we are the Indian Health Service. So we're part of the US Public Health Service. So we have a mandate to take care of individual patients, mm -hmm. but we, are, we also have a huge mandate to take care of the of the entire population, to, we, we work as both, you know, primary care providers and as um, public health workers. So we have to stop outbreaks, and we we have to do it ourselves. So we 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 also have a very long tradition of collaboration with the tribe and with um, the state health department. So we we already have these automatic meetings. You know, for for instance, um, for the disease tur tuberculosis. Um, in the, this 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 past week, I, I had a I had teleconferences to um, work with two states and with the Navajo Nation Department of Health to to address tuberculosis infection here. So we've been working together as a team really tightly for decades. So this is this was nothing new for us. It was simple to to create collaborations when you've already been working together for a while. That's interesting uh, that. It's two sides of the coin. You're, it's a very vulnerable population. On the other hand, you had a system in place that could uh, move more quickly than would assume other systems. Uh, yeah, the country could move. Yes. So we we've dealt with we've dealt with small outbreaks, not not a pandemic, but we were in a sense prepped to deal with the pandemic because we have had experience working with outbreaks of things like. Um, tuberculosis. Um, there's a there's a an endemic uh, condition that's present in rural places called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, and we we're used to collaborating with the state with the tribe on these conditions. So, COVID nineteen was it was not um, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel when this new virus came. I should say that. Do you think the worst is over, or is it always nice to do a victory that, game when COVID's involved? Yeah, that's the um, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? it? We we know from other parts of the world that you can get really great control, and then you see um, you can see secondary waves in the future. So we we are we we are you know 
preparing for the worst. Um, we, we're concerned about the, the influenza season that will come up later this year. It will be very challenging um, right up front in the, let's say in the drive up test site or in the in emergency department triage line to tell immediately who has influenza, who has COVID-19. So we, we anticipate that that will be a problem. We like to diminish the amount of, of um, influenza by vaccinating the whole population. But if your primary care clinics are shut down because of COVID-19, it's um, hard to get the flu vaccine out. So we're trying to come up with novel ways to get the vaccine out to people. So influenza is an issue. School openings are an issue. Um, those are those are the two things that are on the are in my mind right now that we have to look out for. Are you for or against the opening of schools? Um, um, I, I see I see plus and minuses on both sides, and I don't have a strong opinion. I, I'm interested to see what happens over the next week or two in some places. In, in, in a sense, we're learning of this on the fly. We're learning about about the epidemiology of COVID and how to prevent it as we go along. Uh, um, my audience comprises uh, infection preventionists. Any advice? Can you give them uh, final words of advice um, in terms of what you experience and what they can learn from what you experience? I, well, I think, I think uh, making sure that your infrastructure for your facility is is in, in good shape with um, the, the opportunity to have plenty of um, airborne isolation rooms is a, is a good idea, especially if there are aerosol generating procedures that are gonna go on. Um, make sure that you have excellent PPE, that's the way to keep staff safe. And um, you know, follow the CDC guidelines on, on quarantining and um, if, if, if staff are exposed, those are, those are really important things to do. Be very um, well attuned to what's going on in the community and to connect with um, public health officials from, this, from the city, county, or state, wherever your jurisdiction is. Just hospital, hospital facilities ought to be working really closely with us, local public health experts. Dr. Jonathan Aralu, thank you so much for joining us here in Infection Control today. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me.